Dr. Bach, students of the health sciences of Ball State University and Jeff. It is uh, good to be at Ball State and to share a few minutes of discussion with you on a very important subject. I'm delighted to see that a university group is studying the problem of drugs and their use and their abuse. And I'm delighted to know that it is truly a very minimal problem here at the university. But in discussing the problems uh, of the university with a university administrator recently, he said that his university, not here, they essentially had three big problems. The first problem was sex for the students, second was athletics for the alumni, and third was parking for the faculty. Now, here I don't know about number one, and I'm sure that number two is always a problem, and number three is not only a problem for the faculty, but uh, even for the visitors, as I found out this morning in trying to find a, a parking place. <laughs> I like to follow the old adage that no speech is entirely bad if it's short enough. Now, I've been assigned a topic, and the length of time, so you're sort of a captive audience, I came here to talk, and I guess you came here to listen, and I hope we get through at the same time. <laughs> On reviewing the schedule of presentations and noting my name uh, mixed among all of the distinguished guest speakers, I feel flattered, but I also feel just a little bit out of place. My situation brings to mind the story about the two dairy cattle who were grazing in a pasture along the highway, and along came a big white shiny milk truck, and on the sides of this milk truck was painted fresh, rich, pasteurized, homogenized, vitamin A and vitamin D added, and one cow looked at the other one and said, it makes you feel sort of inadequate, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm also always a little bit frightened, a little bit nervous, and a little bit excited before talking to any group. It reminds me, too, a little of my youngest son, who excitedly went off to his first summer camp when he was about nine or ten years of age. We advised him to be sure and write back and uh, tell us his activities and what he was doing. So his first letter back, telling about his participation and his activities, it says, Dear Mom and Dad, tonight we're having a big bonfire and I'm in it. <laughs> I note that the subject matter for all nine sessions of this course is drugs, their use, and their abuse. I note also that most all disciplines that are concerned, except the user himself, has either talked to you or will uh, do so. Such a condition does threaten repetition, but the diversity of speakers probably ensures that little repetition will occur, or at least if it does, it will be approached from a slightly different angle. I'm at a handicap appearing about two-thirds of the way through the course and not having heard what my predecessors at this microphone have said. My assigned uh, part in the discussion on drug dependence and abuse is medical legal conflict. Now this sounds real good, it's like I'm sort of a specialist in the field, like the rest of the speakers participating in this seminar, but believe me, I'm not. I'm simply a country doctor and a general practitioner who has an intense interest in the field and in good government and simply am trying to do something about it. Speaking of a specialist, reminds me also of one of my upper class patients who called me the other day and he usually bypasses me on the way to a specialist except for the common things that are incurable, such as the cold and so forth. But this time he needed a special type of advice. He said, Doc, I've got a problem. I don't know where to go. I said, yes, Frank, what are up on your mind? He said, well, when I call, my prostate hurts. Where should I go, to a lung specialist or to a urologist? <laughs> In these days when the overwhelming cry is for the support of law and order, and when law and order are indispensable to the very existence of our nation, it is difficult for those responsible for enforcement of law and order to do so when there is contradictory thinking and action among our scientific 
and among our governmental leaders in their definition of and in their thoughts on how to handle the addiction problem. Such lack of unanimity of opinion creates medical legal conflict. And I would add early in my remarks that there is less disunity now than at any previous time, and it appears as if the disunity will continue to lessen. It is my opinion that the matter, however, must be studied from both angles. The reason the person is an addict may be medical, but the things he does to support his addiction are most often criminal and thus are legal problems. So my advice is that we cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. And speaking of advice, again reminds me of the most subtle advice that I probably ever received, and I got it in sort of an unusual way. It was taped to the abdomen of one of my patients on whom we were about to operate. When he got up to the operating room, we got the message. It said, I am a young man with a hernia, so please listen, Dr. Galvernia. When carving my middle, please don't fiddle with matters that don't concern you. <laughs> Addiction has been defined by the World Health Organization as a state of periodic or chronic intoxication produced by the repeated consumption of a drug, either natural or synthetic. Its characteristics include as follows. Number one, an overpowering desire or need to continue taking the drug and to obtain it by any means. Number two, a tendency to increase the dose. Number three, a psychic and generally a physical dependence on the effects of the drug. And number four, an effect detrimental to the individual and to the society. The President's Advisory Commission on Narcotics and Drug Abuse in the final report numbered 101 of 1963, defines drug addiction as the compulsive use of chemical agents which are harmful to the individual, to society, or to both. Research shows that pharmacologists have one definition, psychiatrists have another, sociologists another, and law enforcement officials still another. Some drugs are addicting and some persons are addicted by one definition, but not by the other. It sounds like a mess, and it is, but however, it's not fair to blame this particular mess on one group or another. A mess like this has had to have some teamwork. Reliance on drugs by the people of our present generation is unequaled in the history of mankind. For many, life depends on drugs. There are pills to calm us down and pills to pep us up, pills to help gain weight and pills to help us lose it, pills to avoid consumption and pills to, to help us. Drugs are, however, two of sword. They may save lives as well as wreck lives. It all depends upon the prescriber and upon the user. Some of the most dangerous drugs and habituating drugs are very useful under proper circumstances and in proper hands. The abuse of drugs today poses a major health problem and creates a real social danger. The immediate task commissioner of the United States Food and Drug Administration, Dr. James L. Goddard, said this, and I quote, more and more of us are becoming dependent on drugs, hiding from the realities of life or using them just for thrills. Drug abuse cannot be connected only with narcotics users. The alarming rise in the abuse of stimulants, depressant, and hallucinogenic drugs cuts across all strata of society. From Maine to California and from Dakotas to Louisiana, there's no state free from the use and the abuse of drugs. It takes on greater importance and causes more apprehension when we also know that from Harvard to Berkeley and from Alabama to Minnesota, that no campus seems to be totally free of this problem. We have to come up with better answers in the next generation to prevent an epidemic of trip takers and acid heads and potheads. The contagion, although seemingly centered on college campuses, also infects high school students. Although it involves more youth than older people and cities more than small towns, there is no age group nor area that is immune. 
true narcotic addiction is high in the urban and the poor, but the affluent who can't sleep or who can't awaken or feel comfortable without drugs numbers in the millions. The latter may be barbiturates, laxatives, amphetamines, tranquilizers, painkillers, or gas reducers, or what have you, but the taker is hooked on them. There's no social stigma attached to these, even though I sometimes think that taking of some of the more expensive tranquilizers may be considered as a status symbol by some. No one really knows how many are involved, but the problem is too new for an accurate head count. The indicators, however, are that there are 12 billion amphetamine and barbiturate tablets, and I don't know how many millions and millions of tranquilizers manufactured in the United States annually. And about half of these, it is estimated, are diverted into illegal channels. Arrests for the sale of illicit drugs are up 400% in some communities in 1967 alone. Police estimate that between 15 and 50% of teenagers in some suburban communities may be experimenting with marijuana. In 1967, a survey of 2,800 students in two high schools in Great Neck, New York, which is an upper middle class area, showed that 8% admitted smoking marijuana, 6% taking barbiturates without a doctor's prescription, and 2% using LSD or DMT. The district attorney of Nassau County in New York estimated that one child of every six was experimenting with barbiturates, amphetamine, or marijuana. Bernal H. Blanchard, who is the supervisor of Southern California's branch of the state's narcotic bureau, said that he is finding no major peddlers in high schools. Mr. Blanchard said that his undercover agents are even being offered marijuana in ton lots. The pitiful part, however, could be the parental attitude. When 22 teenagers in Queens, New York, were apprehended for selling or possessing LSD, marijuana, barbiturates, and amphetamines, one angry mother told the New York Times reporter, and I quote, I'm still in shock. He was never deprived of anything. Do you know what this does to us? Well, we'll have to move. We live in a small community, you know. The youthful disciples of Leary and Ginsburg seem to follow their leader's advice of light up the candle, tune in, turn on, and take off. Adults, middle income and up, often have a dual problem. Alcohol, then pills to calm the hangover, then pills to pep them up from the uh, pills to calm the hangover, and then drink again to relax. Most of these people get their drugs from a legal source, that is, the doctor or the druggist. Some doctors and druggists are probably too lenient with their bill-paying customers. Others are duped by the patient who goes from doctor to doctor collecting prescriptions and then taking them to different drug stores. Some steal prescription pads and forge prescriptions. They alter the amounts and the dosage, and some even impersonate a doctor and telephone prescriptions to a pharmacy. A careful physician, and I'm sure I believe that 99% are, cautiously weighs the potential harm of a drug against the potential good, then prescribes accordingly. A non-medical or unsupervised use holds no safeguard, only hazard. To rid the nation of the criminal part, one must get out the cause, which is, in my opinion, medical. But medically, we cannot rid ourselves of the problem without a legal approach and without legal help. Persons need to be apprehended, incarcerated, or institutionalized before medical rehabilitation can occur. The attack must be directed at the source, not only for the cure of those using and abusing, but also to help prevent more such unfortunates from falling into the same trap. It's better and it's cheaper to prevent than to cure after the malady has developed. The average citizen seems to feel that there should be stiffer penalties, but also realizes that if the causes are not removed, that the use and the abuse will continue in spite of the severity of the penalty. The certainty of apprehension and penalty is more important than how severe the penalty may be. 
Dr. Stanley Yellick, who is director of the National Institute of Mental Health, said in the Monday, July 15, 1968 issue of the Medical Tribune that progress can and must be made toward reaching the kind of society in which mental and emotional illnesses can develop only with difficulty and in which all those in need can find in their own communities help of the highest quality. He told the House Appropriations Committee that while the task remains formidable, we take pride in our successes to date and inspiration from the importance of our activity. At the end of the 1967, he noted that resident patients in mental hospitals over the United States numbered 426,000. This amounts to 26,000 fewer than just a year earlier and 133,000 fewer than in 1955, the year when the downward trend began. If the old pattern had continued uninterrupted, we would now have 717,000 patients in our mental hospitals, which is 291,000 more than is actually the case. Forgive me for throwing in a little story here and then, but I don't want it to get too dull. I heard a good story the other day about a mental patient. There were two well-meaning friends, one of whom was a minister, went to visit a man who was uh, in the mental hospital and who was getting along so well that he was about to be uh, released in the near future. So he was well enough that they were able to go out in the yard on a nice uh, summer day and, and visit, and as they were uh, visiting out in the yard, a big flock of birds flew over, and of all things to happen, one of these birds had uh, bombed this poor patient right on the head. Now the minister was just a little bit flustered. He didn't want to get this uh, fellow upset because he knew he was getting along well. So he said, uh, that's all right. I'll just uh, run into the uh, uh, building here and uh, bring back some toilet tissue. So he ran into the uh, room or into the building and the uh, patient uh, watched the birds as they continued to fly away. And he turned to the other fellow and said, you know, I wonder if he's crazy. You know, before he gets back with that paper, those birds are going to be miles from here. <laughs> Obviously, such improvement and advances in the number of mental hospital patients could not have been made without a varied research base, ranging from basic laboratory studies to the evaluation of new preventive and treatment programs. Basic laboratory studies in biologic, psychologic, social, and cultural factors of human behavior have involved innovative methods and have been yielding dividends. Dr. Yarrick also said, of special importance is the use of epidemiological studies as a vehicle for assessing programs' effectiveness. And that advances in our various programs are gratifying, but we are unaware that they remain empty unless in some form they reach on target. And that target is the citizen in his community who stands in need of mental health services. Now for this reason that the National Institute of Mental Health is focusing attention on specific target groups such as the Narcotic Addict Rehabilitation Program. So hopefully stress is being placed on the need of modifying an outdated, rigid, an inequitable system for delivery of services into one that is flexible, accessible, and geared to contemporary mental health needs of the American community. This requires the trial of various methods for various areas, for various types of drugs, and under the supervision of various specialists in their fields. Eventually, in a generation or so, the best methods then can be sifted from all of the trials and society will be the winner. Now let's catalog the various drugs and quickly mention their action, their possible medical use, and their risks of abuse. The ones in which we are most interested when we talk about use and abuse are in four classifications. The hallucinogens, the stimulants, the depressants, and the narcotics. Let's take up the hallucinogens first. This group of drugs emerging from relative obscurity has provoked more controversy and has attracted the attention of more people than any drug in history. 
The hallucinogenic drugs are also called psychodisleptic, psychodogenic, and psychoromimetic because of the psychotic-like symptoms that they induce. They are also called psychodelic, which simply means mind manifesting. The hallucinogens are all relatively new in experimental medicine. For the most part, are derived from plants familiar to ancient and to primitive societies, and they're used both in war and in peace. For example, the Aztecs and the Viking berserkers munched on poisonous hallucinogenic mushrooms to work themselves into appropriate warlike or religious moods. Today, some Indians continue to use the peel buttons, which are the cut-off tops of the peel cactus, in the religious rites of the Native American church, whose membership in the United States and Canada still numbers over 200,000. A Frenchman by the name of Moreau de Tours in 1845 first used hashish, which is the uh, stronger form and the old country form of a marijuana, on normal and gifted subjects and concluded that mental illness could be reproduced by it. The hallucinogenic effect of LSD was discovered accidentally in 1943 by a Swiss chemist named Alfred Hoffman. The various hallucinogenic drugs are, that we will talk about are five in number. Number one is marijuana. The nicknames for that uh, are pot, grass, and boo, B-O-O. It has no medical use as far as I'm concerned. It causes altered perceptions and impairs the judgment. The P.O., the nicknames for which are cactus, the button, tops, moon, full moon, the bad seed, and then just the big letter P. The active drug, drug in it is called mescaline, and uh, the nicknames for that are mesk or big chief. It has no medical use and has a, approximately the same action as marijuana, but not as strong. Peyote is also capable of causing psychosis. Peyote is, also, is usually supplied in button form, and it's taken orally, either chopped or ground, in gelatin capsules, or brewed with tea or chewed while drinking coffee, tea or wine or milk in order to cover its bad taste. Others comparable to peyote are psilocybin and psilocin and bufotamine. Number three is LSD, with the nicknames being acid, hawk, the chief, the beast, 25, the ghost, and crackers. I don't know where they got their names, but that's what they are called. And this is 400 times more powerful than the peel button. The chemical from which LSD derives its name is lysergic acid diethylamide. It has no proven medical use and possibly can cause psychosis. It can also possibly alter chromosome anatomy. The dangers of adverse reaction appears greater in the emotionally unstable and the psych psychopathic person. Yet these are the very ones who seem to be attracted to its use. The fourth is called DMT, and the chemical for that is dimethyltryptamine, and it has approximately the same description uh, and toxicities as LSD. A fifth one and a newer one is called STP, and this is an unidentified chemical but suspiciously it has received its name from the oral additive with the same name which uh, these initials stand for scientific treated petroleum. It has about the same properties as LSD except its action is more intense and that it lasts for three to four days so is therefore much more dangerous. The second group are the stimulants and there are four or five of these. Number one is cocaine, medically used as a local anesthetic for mucous membranes, especially in the eye and the nose and throat. Number two is benzodrine, commonly called Benny's, and it is used in the treatment of obesity simply because it does reduce the appetite. It's used also in narcolepsy, in fatigue, and in depression. It can cause nausea, high blood pressure, irritability, confusion, delirium, and the most dangerous part, it, it makes a person more aggressive. 
Number three is dexedrine, commonly called dexes, copilots, or pep pills. And it has essentially the same description and uses and toxic symptoms as benzedrine. The fourth is methadrine, and the, it has a nickname of crystals or pep pills, and it is essentially uh, the same as the dexedrine and benzedrine. The third classification are the depressants. And these are divided into the barbiturates and the non-barbiturates. Of the barbiturates, the main ones that are involved are called uh, nymphs, and the common uh, slang name is yellow jackets because the color of the capsule is yellow. It does have a medical use as a sedative. It can cause an overdosage, incoherence, depression, and respiratory arrest, and eventually death. The second is second all. Its uh, common name is red birds because the color of the capsule is red. It has the same uses and the same toxicity as Nembutol. The third is luminol with the common name of purple hearts because it is a purple color tablet and it has the same description. And the fourth is anatol with the common name blue heavens uh, because of the color of its capsule, and it has the same activities and toxicities as the others. Of the non barbiturates uh, we will mention just three or four, Miltown, or Equinal, Dorobin, Librium, and I suspect many other of the uh, tranquilizers, and in uh, uh, overdosage they have about the same toxicities as the uh, barbiturates. The fourth big classification is uh, the narcotics. Number one is opium, and it does have a medical use uh, for pain. Its overdosage will cause a loss of appetite, temporary impotence, and central nervous system, system depression. The second is morphine, which is a derivative of opium, and it has the same description. The third is heroin, and it is not used medically, but has the same type of toxicity. The old traditional method of the treatment of addicts by hospitalization, gradual reduction of the drug dosage, plus some psychotherapy, but with no outpatient program to sustain the memory re release, results in a 90% returning to their original habit of taking drugs, drugs within a six month period. These figures are from the United States Public Health Services narcotic hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. But rapidly becoming known as the best method of treatment is that used in California. Thousands of addicts have kicked their habit and are returned to society and as normal and useful citizens as a result of the largest treatment program ever undertaken in the country. The California plan was launched in September of 1961, and it consists of compulsory treatment in a rehabilitation center followed by enrollment in an outpatient program. The rehabilitation center is located at Corona, which is about 50 miles from LA, and is technically a penal institution. It has a staff of 500, and in six years' time, 2,100 addicts were in the treatment center participating in a process of group living and group therapy designed to end their dependence on their habits. The typical inmates are classified as 42% white, 12% Negro, and 45% white of Mexican descent. 2,300 more were outpatients, allowed to live in the community as long as they remained off of drugs. For the average patient who was admitted for addiction to heroin, the patient admitted to starting on it at the age of 20. One of every three of the 2,300 patients have been drug-free for one to three years. Two of three have been clean for under a year. And when they've been off of drugs for three years straight, they are released from the program. By July 1967, 239 of them had won release, and only one of these 239 had been known to backslide. Now, these people need outpatient help because the slightest rebuff from a friend or from society or family will tempt them to return to drugs. Some, in fact about half of the patients who are released, return to the rehabilitation center voluntarily 
within a year because they feel a temptation becoming too great. To do so, they simply have to ask their parole agent to recommit them. The second go-around of treatment has seemed to give them a much better chance of success. Dr. Victor Vogel, the former medical director of the Lexington Narcotics Hospital and currently the chairman of California's Narcotic Addiction Evaluation Authority, says there is no doubt that this is the best treatment center in the country for narcotic addicts. California employs treatment in the beginning that is compulsory. 97% are committed involuntarily by court order. Once inducted, the therapy has to be willingly undertaken by the patient if success is expected to be achieved. California commits only for the hard drugs like heroin and not amphetamine or barbiturates. The 3% voluntary enrollments are for six months to two and a half years, while compulsory commitments are for six months to seven years with the length of stay dependent upon their progress. Release from the center inpatient program to the outpatient program is possible within a six-month period. Even if therapy proves ineffective in seven years, the individual is finished with the program, but he may be recommitted for another seven years. The cost of the program has been $7 million per year. commitments are for six months to seven years with the length of stay dependent upon their progress. Release from the center inpatient program to the outpatient program is possible within a six-month period. Even if therapy proves ineffective in seven years, the individual is finished with the program, but he may be recommitted for another seven years. The cost of the program has been $7 million per year. The Rehabilitation Center does not have to face the problem of withdrawal symptoms because the patient has already been through this while he's in the hospital or while he's in the jail awaiting commitment. The problem then is to deal only with the psychological addiction. This is accomplished by trying to change his way of life and by each patient helping the other through group therapy, through mobilization and strengthening of his willpower and his desire so that he will not weaken even under stress. For the many who are illiterate, classes are provided. Vocational education is taught and preparation for life and society is stressed. When a patient has progressed adequately by showing self-control and self-awareness, the staff recommends him for outpatient program, but only after the patient appears before a four-member narcotic evaluation authority. Before he leaves for this outpatient therapy, a job has been secured for him, living arrangements in the community approved, and a parole agent has been assigned. Halfway houses are available in Los Angeles for those who have just been released may stay for a few months. The parole agent checks with the patient once a week to make sure that he is avoiding the on-the-street temptation and that he has truly overcome his habit. The patient attends a weekly outpatient group session and frequent medical exams to make sure he has not reverted to narcotics. New York State studied the California program and was, was impressed sufficiently enough to adopt a singular, simpler, excuse me, similar program that started just last year. A federal program along the same lines passed Congress in 1966, apparently with the idea that rehabilitation on a large scale can work if it is properly endowed and sponsored. <clears throat> An interesting aside is rather than medical legal conflict that there may develop government versus private treatment conflict in the treatment of narcotics users. An incident I'll tell you about happened in uh, this California method of treatment. Time Magazine of July the 12th, 1968 tells about an apparently excellently run private institution called Synanon, S-Y-N-A-N-O-N, which is located in Santa Monica, California. It's a halfway house for narcotics users, and it's based on a combination of self-help, trust, and group therapy, 
and it boasts that as few as 20% of their patients suffer relapses compared to 90% of drug addicts at federal hospitals. So successful is Synanon that five affiliates have sprung up over the country. Nonetheless, all California's narcotic agents raided Synanon and removed two of their 700 voluntary inmates. These two, however, happened to be on parole from the California Narcotic Rehabilitation Center. They were taken to a nearby narcotic center and they were ordered to take tests that would tell if they were actually clean. California law does not or does stipulate that narcotics parolees are subject to periodic surprise testing. On the advice of Synanon's lawyers, the two refused to submit to the test, so they were sent back to the state uh, for a rehabilitation center at Corona to serve out their full terms. Synanon has been putting on a campaign to establish complete jurisdiction over its patients, totally free of state control. The California Court of Appeals has said that the state authorities could not prevent a parolee from living at Synanon and could consider Synanon's program as the equivalent of surprise testing. President Hurst of Synanon argues that the morale of every Synanon resident has been damaged by the state's action. He said, and I quote, morale here is very important. You've got to bury your soul, rebuild your whole personality in a demanding two or three year process. For it to work, you've got to feel completely safe. In the Journal of the American Medical Association of July 15, 1968, Dr. Leon J. Yakimian and Samuel Gershon told of their study of 112 drug abusers who were admitted to Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital. Every fifth admission from January to July of 67 were used in the study. Their study reflected the increasing problem of drug abuse. Heroin users alone, they estimated, were costing New York City $10 million per day in crimes to support their habit. They found that about 50% of these admitted for the drug abusers were also considered schizophrenic before taking the drug. So they felt that protracted psychotic states thought to be due to drug ingestion may be due, in fact, to pre-existing mental disturbance. Two main causes seemed evident from their study. Number one, a desire for euphoria, possibly stemming from depression. And number two, the influence of friends or environment. So this fact might suggest a contagiousness and an endemic factor. Most all patients have used more than one drug before their hospitalization. 5% of all of the 20,000 annual admissions to the psychiatric hospital that's exclusive of alcohol and prescribed drugs, were drug offenders. The facts concerning heroin users that they found was that the mean age was 29 and a half years, that males predominated 21 to 1, the criminal rate of heroin addicts was 70%, with the mean daily expense at $75 to support their habit. There was no evidence that narcotic addiction had genetic or familial basis, although 24% of the heroin users had an addicted relative. It was felt that there was an endemic or environmental or contagious factor superimposed on a sociopathic character defect. Facts concerning the marijuana users that they found, most of this group were severely emotionally disturbed and unstable. Up to 50% of them were schizophrenic. The majority lived alone, but very few of the marijuana users had criminal records. This was probably due to the fact that procurement of marijuana was much less expensive. They found that almost all the amphetamine users were male, and that there was a high incidence of psychosis after their use. The facts they found about the LSD users were, LSD has been blamed for causing psychosis, and it may well be so, they said. But they found that many of the LSD users were schizophrenic before taking LSD. So the question of which comes first is the problem in many instances. In addition, to confuse the picture, many of the LSD users, in fact, 40 out of our 47 of the LSD users in this particular group, had taken marijuana 
amphetamines or heroin in large amounts before ever taking LSD. So the issue is really obscured. Are the prolonged adverse psychotic reactions to the psychedelic drugs due to the drug per se, or are they in fact due to pre-existing psychiatric illnesses with the added insult of the drugs and finally the insult of several LSD trips? In a similar study in 1965, 65 patients whose average age was 22 were admitted to the Bellevue Hospital in New York City due to acute psychosis resulting from unsupervised use of LSD. The predominant symptoms were overwhelming fear, uncontrolled violent urges, and strong auditory hallucinations. Two of these attempted suicide. Twelve appeared to have underlying psychosis or schizoid personalities. Thirty recovered in less than 48 hours and 11 in a week. In six of them, psychotic manifestations persisted for a prolonged period. This was a report by Dr. Lurie in the Resident Physician magazine in the September 66 issue. More and more LSD users are ending up in hospitals with psychosis. Reports also show that LSD may damage chromosomes. Those are the particles that dictate our inherited characteristics. The possible effects on future generations is frightening. Now, why do people take drugs? Adults and kids take them for different reasons. Adults take them for an artificial escape from hard realities that result from pressures and demands of society which are too much to bear and causes excessive anxieties from which they want to escape. Kids take them for a form of rebellion, for kicks, for curiosity, and in a way for escape. For example, anything that enlarges the parameters of the mind is sought after by the intellectual youth. Research psychologist Richard Bloom of Stanford University's Institute for Study of Human Problems reported after an extensive study of 200 addicted persons of all ages selected at random from the San Francisco Bay Area that an addict had the following characteristics. He was more often white than colored. He was more often diverse than not. And I put this in quotes. He earned more than the average man. He had fewer political ties than the average. He tended to rebel against authority. He frequently expressed dislike of his parents, himself, and his work. He had strong likes and dislikes. He was compulsive about his activities. He showed numerous signs of inner conflict. He said that he used the drugs for religious motives or for self-analysis. And he gave a history of frequent use of medicinal drugs in childhood. The byproducts of addiction are crime, unemployment, poverty, loss of human dignity, loss of ability to fulfill a meaningful and productive role in society, and physical and mental damage to the user himself. Addicts can be rehabilitated and returned to useful lives only through long periods of treatment in a controlled environment with a supervised aftercare program. In this way, the addict's needs for medical, for psychological and vocational rehabilitation are provided while at the same time safeguarding the individual's liberty. The treatment is in four phases, withdrawal, convalescence, rehabilitation, and aftercare. A state can choose a variety of methods and combinations of methods of prevention and regulation. <coughs> Okay. I'm just about done here. Number one, you scared me. <laughs> Number one, impose criminal sanctions against unauthorized manufacture, prescription, sale, purchase, or possession of narcotics. And Indiana has uh, almost all of those on record. Number two, Establish programs of compulsory treatment for those addicted with penal sanction imposed for failure to comply. We do not have that. We establish, or number three, is establish public health educational programs. Number four, ameliorate the economic and social conditions that permit addiction to flourish. With the close association of drug addiction and mental illness, it seems to me that we cannot make it a criminal offense for a person to be mentally ill if 
addiction is associated with mental illness, any more than we can for him to be a leper or to have a venereal disease. If narcotic addiction is an illness, then the methods of approach should be comparable. Fundamentally, addiction and drug abuse must be attacked medically, socially, and legally. It must involve every segment of society and all levels of government. So the term medical legal conflict should be changed to medical legal social cooperation if a solution is anticipated. And I believe that that is happening now. And in a few years' time, I think you'll see a great change in the method of handling the problem of addiction. It's been a real pleasure being with you. You've been very kind and attentive, and thank you so much. Those of you who would like to raise a question to uh, Dr. Bowen. Dr. Bowen, how do you feel about labeling uh, drugs of abuse on prescription by a physician? Do you feel that it uh, would be all right to label them as their indication or use? Well, I think that uh, it's a voluntary thing now. I label every, every prescription that I write. I request that it be labeled as to uh, the name of the drug. That has two reasons for it. I think the, uh, the patient knows what he's taken, and uh, second, when they call back and say that little red pill uh, is uh, causing such and such a symptom, or you think I can have a refill of it, and I say, well, look on the bottle and tell me what the little red pill are, or is, and uh, uh, it makes it a lot easier for me, too. But I think that they should all be labeled. Uh, I don't know that it has to be a law to, uh, to do it. I don't think the problem is, is there, really. Do you have a specific instance in mind that... Uh, yes, I have in mind particularly drugs of abuse, where they may not know they are drugs of abuse, and if, if a person knew they were drugs of abuse and had them in a medicine cabinet, they might uh, be more careful how they were uh, available. Well, I think that most physicians, uh, just through ethics alone, will prescribe the uh, drugs with... Uh, or medications with these type of, of uh, drugs in them in very small amounts so that they will be used uh, uh, very, very uh, cautiously and probably not be left uh, any left over. However, I'll admit that uh, you could probably go in uh, 10 medicine room or bathroom uh, cabinets and uh, uh, find uh, perhaps a, uh, a legend uh, drug in uh, two or three of them. And uh, it's a matter of cooperation between the druggist, the patient, and the doctor on making sure that they don't have too much of an oversupply. Mm -hmm. On uh, the sleeping pills, I think they should all be labeled. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that the average age at this hospital was 20 when they first began using drugs. Was this that was uh, like heroin? That's heroin what only. was the average age for the beginning of using any type drug which may, may lead to addiction? I can't give you that uh, exact uh, figure other than I believe I stated that uh, the mean age of all of the drug abusers that were admitted was 29 and a half. So I would assume that heroin was the, one of the uh, uh, drugs that they began to using earlier. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee Indiana putting into uh, an active role a program such as California has for drug addicts? I think that eventually they will, but I, I wouldn't be surprised that the federal government will uh, do it nationally, uh, maybe before Indiana even gets to it. Right now, it's sort of a voluntary thing in Indiana. I think, as uh, Judge Cox mentioned, uh, if he has a drug abuser in front of him uh, and he uh, is ready to sentence him, I think that the sentence can be uh, set aside if he promises to be admitted to a a psychiatric hospital for treatment. Uh, it's so strictly on a voluntary basis now, but I don't think you'll ever whip the problem unless you have compulsory uh, treatment, because these people aren't anxious to be treated uh, uh, at first. Mm -hmm. uh, Doctor, you mentioned this um, treatment center in California. Did you say Corona or Pomona? Corona, C-O-R-O-N-A. And is that the educational part? Is that in any way tied in with the state? Um, College uh, organization, universities or colleges, just like the Pima group is at St. Louis Abisco or something? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Owen, I was wondering about uh, per person cost of the California plan. Well, it's seven million dollars per year, and they had uh, twenty-nine hundred or twenty-one hundred on uh, inpatient and twenty-three hundred on outpatient. So, uh, and they have a few halfway houses. So, uh, I, I don't know. Divide uh, forty-four hundred uh, into the uh, seven million, and you get it. I'm not that good a mathematician. That's fast here. <laughs> yeah. Who pays for this hospital? Is it state supported or? Right out of the taxpayer's pocket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, Dr. Bowen is going to stay with us for lunch, so for any of you that would like to talk with him further at that time, we stand recess until 1 o'clock. Thank you. Mm -hmm.